the kind of issue with cold outbound is there's too much asking for stuff from the recipient and not enough giving of value. And so the more you can give value, the more likely someone is to to respond to whatever your ask is. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hashtag Startup Basics series in the Insights Alley podcast, where startup founders and teams can learn from proven founders and experts about product, growth, sales, strategy, and everything in between to make their own startup successful. I'm your host, Arun Verma, and let's get started. In today's episode, we will talk to Olaf Mathe, who is the co-founder and CEO of Mixmax. We would discuss everything about how to do outbound outreach using cold emails for the purpose of selling your product to potential customers. From overall strategy, list building, sequencing of emails, content, assets, call to actions, follow-ups, to the funnel of this, we would discuss everything. So here is the episode. Hello, Olaf. Welcome to Insights Alley. And thanks a lot for taking out some time for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Arun. Excited to be here. So, Olaf, would you like to start with telling us your story in brief from your early career from McKinsey to Skype and now Mixmax? Sure thing. Happy to share. And actually, my career, startup career started even before then because I had uh, two startups even before joining joining McKinsey. My story, I think I could kind of, I have a science background and realized trying to be an academic that it probably wasn't for me and that it wasn't fast paced enough. And so fortunately, back in the day, I had a friend who had started selling magazine subscriptions online and seemed to have a lot of autonomy and fun and was making good money doing that. And so through this friend influence, I got hooked on on startups, uh, which of course eventually led me led me to Mixmax. And so with regards to Mixmax, as you mentioned, I've worked at Skype for a while and I've always personally been a communications geek and my co-founders have been too. And so Mixmax was very much born out of a frustration with the paucity and oversimplicity of a lot of the tools we use to communicate. And we kind of felt that there has to be ways to uh, communicate in richer, more effective and more empowering ways. And above all, I think we felt the kind of real dearth and communication came as soon as you had to be a closer or talk to customers or do anything with customers. Uh, Because the kind of default communication channel you were stuck with was email, which is a flat, unproductive and like non-interconnected, non-interactive medium. Uh, And so we got really excited about the potential of what that medium could be and how we could empower people in in customer-facing roles to to have better conversations. Right. So let's start with today's topic. How would you, Olaf, describe uh, what is outbound sales and like what would it mean specifically when we say we are doing outbound sales by cold emails in B2B startups? Yeah, I think about this a little bit from from the Mixmax perspective, of course, and I think it's helpful to distinguish. Are you doing genuinely cold outbound? That is, uh, the person you're emailing has no relationship to your product or service whatsoever, or might they be somewhat warm? Might they have seen uh, some kind of paid ads you've done? Uh, might they have been part of some kind of marketing initiative, like downloaded an ebook, and then you're outbounding them or the company overall? And then there's kind of the deeper version of this, which is if you have have in part a self-serve or at the very least a free trial business model, have people signed up for your product? And once they have, are there other people at that account you can outbound? So think about it as a spectrum from outbounding people who know literally nothing about you to people who are actually very familiar with your product or service. Right. As you mentioned also, there is one end of the spectrum where no one knows anything about you, right? So I believe a first step in that would be to build a list, which is basically making a list of all the people you'd be sending these email to, right? So my question is like, what and how do you see this process of list building? Basically, what needs to be the overall strategy? And then obviously how to do this list building exactly from a step by step point of view? I think for any list building, of course, perhaps this is obvious, but you really want to know what your ideal customer profile looks like. And figuring that out can be, I think, very, very hard. And even some mature companies battle with that. And so what that means is just your ideal customer profile is you know the type of person who is likely to respond positively to uh, the value that you're providing. And so this can become a really nuanced topic. For example, if you're selling uh, BI, so business intelligence software, and you're trying to sell that to me at Mixmax, 
X, I probably won't be very receptive because we're a roughly 50 person company. We already have some tooling. Our needs for BI aren't super sophisticated right now. Whereas, you know, when I was at a company like Skype, we had like very rich needs for, you know, executive dashboards, etc. So even though just looking at, for example, title, right, will obviously not not be sufficient. You want to understand, you know, the specifics of the type of org you're selling to and the type of uh, needs that that customers have. So, yeah, overall, I think people spend too much time list building and not enough time uh, investigating and understanding who their ICP is and their exact target target persona. Uh, makes sense. So uh, like for even list building, there are many tools as well as one can use some human services also, right? So any advice on yeah. how can one use them both effectively and any specific tools that you would suggest? Very interesting question. I, I feel I don't have a very firm perspective on that in part because our business is so based on inbound and upselling inbound. And, and I mean, there are a variety of tools for doing this from literally using Sales Navigator through to trying to automate this with, you know, tools like Discover org or node or clear bit so there are a whole host of tools i think early on you can actually do yourself a real service again assuming you've spent the time on building your target persona by actually doing a lot of the list building manually on your own on linkedin and the real benefit of doing that is you will start to get a kind of tacit or unconscious awareness of the various flavors of your target persona what they you know look and feel like and what they smell like Right. That actually makes sense. And that in turn will help you just write better, more incisive messaging. Right. So next comes the step of obviously sending the scold emails, right, to these people in your list and definitely using a tool, something like Mixmax. And obviously uh, one need to make a sequence of emails, right? So no one would be probably buying you from just one email. So my question is, uh, what is meant by a sequence in this case? And like, what should be the overall strategy? How to think around this when sending the emails and making sequences? Yeah, really, really fun question. Um, I guess the way we think about this is we think about it uh, pretty, pretty broadly. There is a feature in MixMix called called sequences. Sequences is a little bit also like a household name in the industry for what is essentially email campaigns, which is just you send an email, then a couple of days later, the person hasn't responded, the system automatically sends another email. We like to think about this much broader and in a much richer way. And basically what sequences do is they automate what you what you in a closing role or as a rep might be doing on your own manually. And so if you think about this, you're actually doing way more than just emailing. You might be calling, you might be texting, you might be sending in mail, you might be, you know, tweeting people, whatever it might be. And so ideally, the automation solution you have kind of accommodates all those, all those, all those different, different options. And so a very natural way, perhaps if you're trying this out, and again, I'm a huge fan of trying to do things manually before you automate it. And if you're actually emailing people from your target persona, and you're learning about about these people on your own and you're doing it manually at first how many emails does do you feel it takes you manually to reach someone what are the types of responses you get just try to get a more organic feel for people and I think this is a little bit of different philosophy than the kind of spray and pray shotgun send 10,000 send 10,000 emails approach and it might depend a little bit on the type of service service you you are at well and there's a whole range of schools of thought on kind of like how to do this from you know at least five touches up to you know you want to do at least 10 touches and it wants to be a mix of calls and in mails and uh, various various social social messaging right any deeper thoughts on how, how many sequence like how many steps or do you differentiate on do you make multiple sequences or do you make uh, how many steps up to which you take a, a, a sequence and with what cadence you send from email to email yeah, I mean, I think that the kind of standard there is something that's seven to nine steps with a mix of emails and calls and potentially in mail. And probably they're running on like a three day interval. In my mind, I think one of one of the things that would, the industry overall would be hugely helped by assumption, something we actually enable in MixMax. And that is in, in a lot of cases, someone is outbounding you and it's just like you're not the target persona. Right. They did a poor job of their initial list building. And so that's kind of essentially just spam. The other place where this gets wrong is you are the target persona, but the timing's wrong. 
So in the case of BI, right, it could be uh, someone's trying to sell me a BI solution. I know we want to get better at BI. However, that's going to be an initiative in six months to 12 months time. Okay. And it's way too hard for me to submit that info to someone when that they're when I'm being outbounded. And so a nice thing, if I could do a little product plug that we do with Mixmex is we make it really easy for you to embed polls directly in an email. So you can say, hey, you know, would you be interested in connecting about this now? Or did you want to connect this about this later? Or, you know, forget about about it, we're just totally not interested. And the recipient can just tap in one click to say, you know, yes, I'm ready now, or no, reach out in three months or six months or nine months, or no, I'm just not interested. And the beauty of that response is that response can then trigger an automated message in turn in six or nine months or whenever it is. Apart from uh, the persona of the recipient, do you think, uh, what do you think is a difference between a good sequence versus a bad one? So this will come as no surprise, given uh, given how much I t- spoke about spoke about uh, the personas. Good or bad, in my mind, is not about timing interval. It's not about uh, you know how many messages total. It's all in the messaging and being relevant. And so there are a number of different tactics tactics for this and making it kind of easy for easier for people to opt in and to opt out. An interesting observation I have is the couple of people who have outbounded be most successfully have actually not tried to sell to me. And so by that, I mean, often when you get outbounded, people outbound, they try to get time on what I would call your professional calendar. So they say, hey, can we set up, you know, 15 minutes later on this week so I can show you my amazing solution for whatever it is. And somewhat unlikely, especially in like leadership positions to make time for that because your your calendar is so is so swamped, right? When someone, however, is trying to get time on what I would call your quote unquote personal calendar, the kind of fundamental dynamic of this shifts. And so the way this shifts is people who say, hey, I'm, you know, a fellow co-founder just like you. Here's our amazing BI product. I think we I think this is tailored directly to 50 person startups just like you. Could I get some feedback on my pitch? Or could you give me advice on how to position this product? Here's someone we know and in, in common. And suddenly the ask is slightly different. And so yeah, it's just a it's just an alternate. It's easier to free up time on your quote unquote personal calendar sometimes than it is on your professional one. Right. So this is we are basically talking about the content, which is I guess the most important thing in these email sequences, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I would like to rephrase the question like what exactly you send in an email from a narrative perspective right so there could be multiple different types of strategy based on which you your words would resonate in the email body right so how do you think around that okay one example is as you mentioned uh, that i am a fellow entrepreneur and making this deal and would love to get uh, your feedback one could be like this then one would be something of sorts okay i'm trying to pitch my features or benefit driven statement something like that another example could be i'm trying to gauge okay do you have this problem uh, i pitch something like do uh, xyz people face this problem uh, are you also facing this problem i would love to help or s- some sort of situation so what are your thoughts on this what could be the different narratives with which people should create their email body on yeah i would say as a prospective buyer the biggest mistake people make and this only works if you're explicitly if i'm explicitly in the market for bi only then will i respond to someone pitching their bi product and perhaps not even then so single biggest mistake is stop talking about your product <laughs> <laughs> right make this about the prospective customer or make this about a change in the world no one wants to hear your pitch People get pitched all the, all the time, right? And so I think this is more about how can you spark some interest in your prospect, make it about the make it about the prospect, or ideally even make it about a change in the world that your prospect is seeing in their industry. Yeah, there's someone called Andy Raskin who writes quite a lot about this, and he wrote this blog post where he kind of dissected Zora, which is a, subscri- a subscription company that helps you manage kind of subscription billing. His overall perspective on this, what makes that kind of sales pitch so successful and here's where i think it's relevant for outbound sales is the pitch was not about the product it wasn't about whatever company was trying to sell it wasn't necessarily even about the person being outbounded it was about a change in the world and so it outlined big change in the world that's happening that would resonate with the person who's being outbounded and so in zora's case it's about you know hey people don't own stuff anymore they subscribe to services and like this is playing itself out in every single industry in the world. And therefore, you need to think about, you know, the subscription economy overall. 
makes sense uh, any thoughts on how could one personalize anything in that email content right so personalized either from a company wide perspective or even individual recipients also any thoughts on that yeah i mean there's so many ways and tools that can help you with this it goes back to knowing who your who your customer is one thing that i do like if you want to have a higher volume approach there's a way to kind of write one message and just have it automatically be customized for whoever it reaches and so yeah, there are a couple of products that have this. We have this at Mixmax too. It's called Liquid Markup. And so it lets you say, you know, do very basic personalization. That still is very powerful where you say, you know, if someone has a particular role, open with this opening statement. If they have a different role, use this other opening statement. And so what it lets you do is it lets, really helps you with account-based selling. And it helps you send the same sequence basically to multiple different people at different levels of seniority in a company. In the Mixmax context, what we might do, right, if we were to outbound would be an opening we might tailor this to an opening statement to an ae on in the account might be do you know you could be saving three hours a week with a better scheduling system or right. here are most aes lose three opportunities by forgetting the follow-up whereas the, the question or messaging you might have to someone in sales leadership in that context might be do you feel you have enough visibility on what your team is doing or how do you know your team is working on the highest value activities Right. Something like that. So the value props are just very, very different. Right, exactly. So it resonates with the exact persona of that recipient that yep. you're sending, right? Any like, So there could be a spectrum from a persona base to actual individual person also, right? So for example, someone is, let's say, pitching to you as a CEO and co-founder of Mixmax, right? So like, yep. what would the best way to personalize? On an individual person basis? It's, it's interesting because I feel a lot of people, there's kind of one school of thought, which is the best way to personalize this is, you know, check their recent activity on LinkedIn and understand if what sports they like and reference that or see if you went to the same school, etc. And part of me feels that, you know, that's kind of the poor man's personalization. The best personalization is with, if, if you're able to ask a question that directly resonates with them in their particular uh, capacity or job. And that goes a little bit down to this end raskin thread uh, that i evoked earlier which admittedly is harder because you're not always sure what type of question will resonate the most whereas you can see where someone went to school or what they posted about on social social media so it is a little bit harder however i think the rewards are greater and there are ways to test this right with a b testing and the like right makes sense so let's talk about how would you suggest to perhaps use gifs emojis images links to videos and perhaps PDFs explaining more about your product. What would your advice be on what to do with these assets and how to do it best? Yes. So I really think that the overall point of these assets is to, to make your communication stand out. So you're different and distinctive. And above all, you can be personalized with that, right? You can record a video just for someone, just like you did when you <laughs> upended me. Right. Probably if you hadn't had, so for context, when you, like for listeners, right, when you upended me, you had a picture of yourself with like a whiteboard where it said, hey, Olaf, join my podcast or some podcast or something. And I'm sure you do that to a gazillion people. And that was fine. I know that. And it still felt personal and valuable. And so I'm a huge fan of using these assets to make your message uh, more personal. And also most people don't go through the hassle. And so there's kind of this tacit social contract, right? Whereas where hey, if you, Arun, did a bunch of work to try to reach me, that, you know, implicitly makes me a little bit more likely to respond because it shows me that you care. Right. And so that implies kind of that I should care and I should reciprocate because I'm clearly not just part of a, you know, one, one size fits all, fits all uh, sequence. And so the beauty here of assets like videos and GIFs and PDFs is they're awesome. I think you want to include them overall. They help tell your story better. They help engage with the recipient better. They above all tell a more visual story where visuals are great. And the one caution I would have is it's actually great too, because it's a way to make your sequence richer by alternating through uh, different asset types in each message. Uh, so perhaps you have one touch with just a video, another touch which is a screenshot, another touch which is a GIF, another touch which contains emojis, etc. Right, that may actually makes sense. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's talk about call to actions in the email CTAs. What should be the strategy? Either you right away ask for a meeting or a call, or you know perhaps sort of asking, can I set up a demo for you? Or perhaps ask, are you interested in this product or not? Like, is this relevant to you or not? So, what should the strategy be here? 
Great question. Yeah, I think this ideally you have a CTA that almost is varied by message. And ideally, you can actually test uh, various CTAs with a similar type of message. Yeah, I'm not even sure always you, I guess I'm a little bit of the thought that I think a lot of CTAs, uh, there are kind of two schools of thought here, here again, either you can have a CTA that's like incredibly direct, you know, here's my calendar, book a time, which I'm in part a huge fan of in a lot of contexts, if you get really good at the question asking, perhaps your CTA is much softer. And since most people won't respond to your cold uh, messages until, you know, message four, at the very best, you might actually wait, wait to ask for what you really care about till you get to that message. And up until then, you're kind of just, just providing value or sharing an interesting perspective or something they, this particular person really, really wants to know about. Overall, I think in the kind of issue with cold outbound is there's too much asking for stuff from the recipient and not enough giving of value. And so the more you can give value, the more likely someone is to to respond to whatever your ask is. And I'm assuming with most cold outbound, right, you actually want to get someone on a call. You need to ask for that at, at some point. I think the devil it, here is in the details of, of when you do mm-hmm. and making sure you provided enough value beforehand. And perhaps the CTA on parts of these are earlier on, do you have any experience in the Zora example, it would be, do you have any experience with the subscription economy or what's your experience been? Yeah. And in a lot of cases, I think the CTA is should actually be tell me how you want to engage with me going forward. Not literally that, but you want some version of I'm really not interested. This is interesting for me in nine months time or yes, you know, set up time with me next week kind of thing. Right. So like just give them three options and they can just reply on to, OK, I just want this one. Right. Yes. Makes sense. Makes sense. So let's talk about the funnel of this. Right. So from your recipient's perspective, so it would be subject line then email open, email read, then perhaps a link click if you have, and obviously replying as per the CTA. How should one optimize this funnel and what should the strategy be here? I think the one thing is, I mean, here you need to monitor your metrics everywhere, of course, across this uh, across this funnel, which is probably an, an obvious point and some I feel not a lot of a lot of people do. Uh, and perhaps you want to optimize for one thing at a time here, too. Uh, and of course, everyone knows that if you're running an A-B test, you can't, you know, change too many variants. I think it's just in terms of what's the end result you're trying to drive for. So are you really trying to drive open rates or reply rates or click rates or whatever it might be? And if it is open open rates and focus religiously on the on the subject line. And for that, by the way, it's pretty important to use a software where you're actually sending your messages through your actual Gmail account versus using, you know, a HubSpot or a MailChimp or something that sends through a third party system, because the likelihood of those messages ending up in spam or, you know, some non-priority filter is just too high. Right. It won't yeah. land up in the primary box ever. Right. Yes, for sure. And so I think there's a lot you can do to understand if you've actually built your list well enough and if your subject line is compelling enough just by looking at opens about opens. And again, on replies, the easier you make it for someone to reply, the higher your reply rate will be, which is why I'm a big fan, again, of inserting like the little mix max plug here, the polls directly in the email or whatever it might be, or to your point, having some kind of rich media directly in the email to make your email stand out. And of course, the more onerous uh, the ask is, the less likely you are to get a reply in the first place. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Any tip that you've seen working in terms of the whole overall strategy on how to optimize uh, subject lines? Because I get, I guess the open rate is, it's, it's actually the first step also. So that's very important. Yes. Uh, the one thing I would say that I just consistently see that's a pretty strong sign that it's not interesting to me is subject lines being too long. Often they're also interestingly too too specific and very often preceded by like square brackets where it says, you know, invite or webinar or uh, something like that. There's actually a fun during the Obama election in 2008, uh, people did lists of his uh, fundraising email subject lines. And they were all wonderful because they were very short. They were factually accurate and they just had the just the right level of kind of, of uncertainty. So an Obama subject line colloquially it might be something like need your help or uh, can you help me? I'm not saying these are like great subject lines. I'm using them as an example of very short subject lines that speak to what you're looking for that still leave a little bit to desired versus square bracket webinar, learn more about the subscription economy. 
Right. And I guess one thing also to keep in mind is like most people open their these emails in their mobile phones, right? So it you should have crisper and shorter email uh, subject lines because it would truncate everything. If yep. You can't even read them otherwise. <laughs> right. Olaf, how do you know if your funnel conversion and stepwise conversion is good or not? Like any benchmarking data or if not, like how one should be able to find such benchmarking data? Yeah, great question. They fill their fair amount of resources for this online. Uh, we see our customers typically having, you know, open rates above 70% and reply rates above above 40. I think here it's the devil is so in the details here of what you're, who you're targeting, how well you built the list, uh, who you're writing to, what your service is. The way I like to think about this is start, establish a baseline, and then just set a weekly target to improve on it. Right. It just doesn't help you to know that, you know, HubSpot cold outbound emails that they send out have a, you know, whatever it is, 10% reply rate or a 50% reply rate if you're in, you know, if you're a security company. Right. Makes sense. Olaf, what should be the follow-up strategy from a very fundamental question, like how many follow-ups and then also like when to just let it go. Uh, curious to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think this would be, I mean, it goes back to the number of steps in a sequence, right? I don't think you, overall, I don't think you can follow up enough. So I think the problem is almost any service people are sold has some value and people are going to want to buy it at some point in time. So the question for you as an outbounder is, is your timing for this particular person right? Or okay. have you found the right person who even cares about this particular area? So like, would you suggest, let's say someone made a sequence and they went through every step for two, three months, they were sent, let's say seven, eight emails, right? Now, would you suggest, okay, with the same list, you can try another sequence after three months or like how to think around and repurpose those lists where no one replied? Yeah, I think it's a great idea to repurpose lists for people that you might not have gotten a response from, you know, six to nine months later. Okay. Any advice on A-B testing? Is it even useful to do, especially in, you know, when uh, the numbers game is very small? Uh, Any thoughts around that? If you don't have a big list, I'm not sure how useful it is. Then I think you'll do better trying to get some qualitative qualitative feedback and there are there will be generic tips, right? Like generically shorter subject lines are better if we're talking about open rates, misleading subject lines, directly misleading subject lines backfire. Right, of course. Yeah. So there are still like general general tips for if you to apply. If your list is small enough, A B test doesn't matter. I know everyone thinks that you need to A B test everything. The problem is if you don't have a big enough sample, you're you're actually not learning. Right. One interesting thing people do is threaded versus non-threaded email, right? So suppose in one sequence, all the emails that you'd be sending to would just be threaded in the same uh, email thread, right? Or sometimes they do, you send one email and a fresh new email would be sent. So like, how would you suggest this strategy should be used upon? Like, A great question. I actually don't uh, have data on this on the top of my mind. Uh, so perhaps my reflections on this would be a little bit theoretical. I can, I can think about it from the vantage point of the recipient, and it kind of depends a little bit. If I know I'm not interested and it's threaded, that just increases the likelihood of me, you know, deleting it instantly because I see it's, see it's part of that, you know, that same thread. If it's something I'm just like tangentially interested in or longer term, it might be helpful to not thread it because it shows that it's kind of a separate conversation and a separate value point. Overall, I'm a big fan of threading and following follow-ups for uh, people you've already engaged with. So there's a, this is a huge leaky part of the funnel often is perhaps you've had a first call, you did some disc or a demo, and then, you know, people turn into no-shows. At right. that point, you already have some kind of relationship with them. And so here I feel you can be pretty unapologetic about following up. Very likely, if you've been doing it right, you actually gave them something in your first interaction or first call. And so it is fair to accept something back, even if it's a uh, hey, we decided this wasn't a priority. Makes sense. Makes sense. Olaf, uh, you mentioned briefly earlier also, what other touch points could be there? So you mentioned perhaps a LinkedIn in mail or a shout out to an Twitter. So like, yep. could you tell us, uh, me and the listeners, uh, how do you think around this and what could be the strategies? Yes. Yeah. 
I think it helps to try through different media. So be it email, be it phone, be it LinkedIn and mail. And then you want to think a little bit about what the context is for other types of media. Twitter, for example, I think is a little bit different tenor than uh, sending an email to someone. I think the fact of the matter is everyone has their own particular communication preference or a particular medium, medium through which they're more likely to respond. And so especially if you're selling to into leadership, people might just not respond via voice or not respond to you via email. However, LinkedIn is a place where they respond. And so you want to try many different different media to like uh, maximize your likelihood of success. Right. So like your outbound email campaign should be a completely 360 degree outbound outreach. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that. Right. Olaf, there is this regulation of GDPR also, which is very important. Could you explain a little bit about what is that and what should startups be aware of regarding GDPR when seen, sending these cold emails? Yes. Uh, so quite a lot. So uh, GDPR is recent regulation that was enacted in Europe in May 2018. And it basically gives individuals greater right and control over their data. And as such, it's a great piece of legislation. And so it contains a couple of it kind of one of the main gists of this is uh, the right to be forgotten. So if I've interacted with your service, and I, you know, I don't want you to keep a permanent record of me, I have the right to, you know, request that you delete me. It also can turn provisions to kind of like protect my data from being resold or reshared at the very least without, you know, companies need to be very explicit about it if they engage in practices like that. And also, in theory, you can't really cold email people. Okay. Uh, people have to consent to receive communications for from you. And so this is for people based in Europe. And so, so far, uh, I'm not sure the extent to which GDPR has been litigated overall. I think it seems like ad networks have been the ones most most affected by it. And I think this is one of the reasons, too, why you want to have a much more tailored uh, approach versus a spray and pray approach, because you're much more likely to get people pissed at this if your communication comes across as genuinely unsolicited. For example, your email where you had this custom picture where it was like, hey, Olaf from Mixmax, uh, you know, would love to do a podcast with you. That just doesn't come across as, as unsolicited. Uh, so it does put greater demands on personalization for you. Makes sense. Absolutely. In B2B especially, your lists could have many people people from the same company you are sending the emails to right so we discussed that earlier also it could be gatekeepers or the buyers the decision makers or actual product users or my question is how should the strategy differ for each these type of persona within the same company any quick tips on that yeah, yeah, I think you want to make sure you're tailoring your message to the particular uh, to the particular role that the person has. So it goes back to a little bit, I think what I mentioned with a uh, liquid markup where you can kind of conditionalize it. So individual contributor gets a certain type of message, whereas the team leader or manager on the team gets uh, another type of message. Right, right. Makes sense. Well, Olaf, that was pretty much it. Any final advice you would love to give to founders and early stage teams while doing cold emails for outbound B2B sales? Yeah, fun, fun conversation and really rich one and great, great questions. I think I would circle back to the initial point here for talking B2B sales and outbound, uh, spending the upfront time to getting to know uh, your customers and your ICP. And there are great ways to do this. You can literally spend days on site with your initial couple of customers and asking them for referrals and building this out through a very manual, non-scalable process before you try to put uh, yeah, a more, more automation around it. Makes sense, so. makes sense. Good luck. Any resources you'd suggest to listeners? Books, people, blogs, perhaps? Yeah, actually, I think perhaps that that one, I think in terms of positioning, the one sales deck uh, that I really like, that I recommend is this deck by Andy Raskin, uh, where he talks about how Zora positions and sells their product without actually talking about the product at all, right. which I think is a real Jedi mind trick. So uh, I wish more people outbounding would do less of a product pitch and talk to me more about something in general in the world that concerns me. Ask me a question I'm directly concerned about. Makes sense. Uh, anything you would like to plug in your Twitter or LinkedIn? How can people reach out to you? Uh, sure thing. Yeah. So again, super excited to be on this podcast. Overall, it's particularly fun because of course you can use Mixmax, M-I-X-M-A-X for a lot of what we just spoke about. And so we're all about helping early stage companies uh, hit their customers and reach their customers and engage with them in better and more more empowering ways. So uh, you can find us on Twitter as well on at Mixmax. And you can find me on Twitter as at Olofster. Well, Olof, thank you so much for all the insights. It was a pleasure having you on the show. You too, Arun. Really fun. Bye-bye. Bye. 
that's it folks thanks for listening do give me your feedback about the podcast what could be improved what topics and guests you would like to see on insights ali you can leave a comment on the youtube video or could email me at arun at insightsali.com you can also message me and connect with me on instagram twitter etc my handle everywhere is at the rate arun triple one nine two and remember always be learning bye